Good morning. Welcome to Mount Zion Baptist Church's live stream. Our mission at Mount Zion takes its inspiration from Ezekiel 34, 16. I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed. With the help of modern technology, we can gather and virtually praise, worship, and minister God's Word. If this is your first time tuning in, we would like to give you a special welcome. You could have picked any church's live stream, but you chose ours, and we thank you for that. Our ministry is to spread God's Word throughout the world, whether it be in person, at our church, or virtually on your phone, tablet, computer, or smart TV. Make sure to like, subscribe, and share us online at mountzionhudson.org and on social media via Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Periscope, and Twitch TV. Please share this with your family and friends, and thanks again for joining us. We appreciate it, and we appreciate you. God is good all the time. time. Listen, man, we had a good first service. They were excited. Y'all had another hour to sleep, didn't you? Let's try this again. God is good. Oh, I like that all the time. He is a good God and we're here to worship him, to learn from him. Thank you so much for being here to, to worship him, whether online or in person. It's just great to be together. If you open up your bulletin, several things I want to highlight for you, please. Uh, Notice, of course, the memorial service coming up on the 14th. We invite you to be part of that. Uh, If you've lost someone in 2020, we want you to be part of that service. So if you haven't yet, contact us at the church office and let us know which uh, service you'd like to attend and the names of that individual we'd like to honor. Just a reminder, you see it there, don't forget about the devotions on Tuesday through Thursday of each week on Facebook, on our website. encourage you to check those out. As well as the youth and children are doing that online Bible study. So trying to have some online things to engage you throughout the week. So please take advantage of those. You do see the sign up for special music. If you play an instrument or, or sign or sing or have some kind of God-given talent like that, we want you to come be part of the special music. You see Emily's information there if you contact her and get you signed up for special music. Then, of course, on the back of your bulletin, you see the camp information about the youth and children's camps and the backup plans for that as well, so please see that. I will call your attention to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, we're just over $28,000. What, what an incredible thing. Um, but it's been laid on my heart. I, I want to challenge us, um, not for the sake of, of numbers, but uh, I, think God, I think God might be calling us to give a little bit more. Um, there's a great need with our missionaries right now. So I want to challenge each of you to bring $10 with you next week. Uh, if we all bring $10 or give it online, um, then we're able to knock that goal out. And like I said, not just for the goal's sake, but uh, I think God's maybe saying, hey, let's do a little bit more. So I challenge you. Uh, and I got a big family, so 10, dim- 10 times however many kids are there is a lot. No. Um, but let's all bring $10 next week, see, see what we can't do with that. So I, I encourage you to do that and pray about that as well. Besides these, are there any an- other announcements or corrections? Let's celebrate then. Any birthdays today or this past week? Any birthdays? Happy birthday, Ernie. Happy, happy birthday. Do what? 
Christmas Eve was your birthday. Uh, you were 39. Wow, you look good for 39, Ernie. Yeah. What about any anniversaries today or this past week? All right. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Let's stand up, just wave at each other and say, it's great to see you this morning. And just to feel God's presence with us this morning as we are singing our two praise and worship songs, Made New and In Christ Alone.
Good morning. Any prayer requests anybody wants to share this morning? Any unspoken? I'm sorry? Sharon McDowell, yes. Any others? Any unspoken? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day. We thank you for this church. We thank you for this community that we uh, have a place to come and worship, that we can share our burdens and leave them at the foot of the cross. We lift up uh, Sharon and Richard McDowell right down this morning, others that have gone unspoken, that are on our hearts. Um, we just want to come to you, Lord, and, and uh, as Stephen has been teaching and preaching for the last few weeks about um, not carrying that baggage, those burdens of sin and, and troubles on, in our hearts and our lives, uh, just to put them at your feet and give them over to you and trust you in, in, the, in the things ahead. Uh, we don't know um, the days uh, that are before us, but we know that you've already claimed the victory, and we can share in that, and we can uh, have joy and peace in our lives if we'll just trust you in, in all things. We thank you for the leadership of this church. We ask your continued blessings on Stephen and Chris and Emily and, and uh, our, our whole staff here. Lord, we just pray that you'll continue to use each one of us as we go to school or work or wherever we might be this week to share the love of Christ and the people we come in contact with. We just thank you for all the many good things that we often take for granted that, Lord, we'll, we'll just come to you each and every day and trust in you and we'll give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, kids of all ages from zero to 100. I hope that everybody has had a great weekend. It was somewhat beautiful weather. It was sunny out. So I hope you all got to enjoy that this past weekend. Um, today I have something that I want to show you, and it's something that I think is pretty cool. Um, so, But when you see it, I want you to shout out what it is. Is everybody ready? That's right, this is a train. Uh, it's something that we're all familiar with. Um, it's, most of us, I'm sure, have seen it going up and down this way every once in a while, or, or we've heard it at some point. Um, but I have a passage of scripture that I want to share with you, and it's out of Jeremiah 29, 11. And here's what it says. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Now, I got a question for you. Um, what part of the train is the most important? Okay, that's, that's good. That was good. I'll talk about that one later. Uh, but the, yeah, some of you said the most important part of the train is the engine, the engine train, the one where you put the coal in or, or whatever it runs off of, and it, it, that's the part that drives the train. See, without the engine... The other cars do nothing. Without the engine, the other cars serve no purpose. Um, in order for the cars to complete their tasks, like this one, they have to have the engine to guide them along. Well, our relationship with Jesus is the same exact way. See, the scripture tells us that Jesus knows what his plans for us and our lives are. See, we have a purpose in life just like this train or just like this car um, but if we don't let Jesus guide our way if we don't like the engine let him lead along the way to pull us along then we don't serve any purpose for the kingdom of God and so my challenge for you is this make sure that just like this uh, this engine train make sure that Jesus is the one that's pulling us and guiding us along his path his plan for us is so much greater than we can even imagine. Uh, just like the engine guides this. That's the plan for this train. So we have to let him have full control over our lives so that we can live out the purpose that he's given us. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. And we thank you for this time that we have to come together and to learn about, God, how we can let you lead the way. And Father, as, as Pastor Stephen comes up and as he shares the message that you've given him, we pray that you be with him as he boldly proclaims the gospel to us. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
One day there'll be no more waiting left for our souls. One day there'll be no more children longing for home. One day when the kingdom comes right here where we stand, we will see the promised land. Mm. One day there'll be no more lives taken too soon. One day there'll be no more need for a hospital. One day every tear that falls will be wiped by his hand. We will see the promised land. That'll be a good day, won't it? Y'all yeah. Yeah. let me know when you're ready. I'm going, that'll be a good day, won't it? Come on now. You're in the house of the Lord. Jesus Christ came, lived, died, and resurrected. I'm a little excited this morning. I only had one Coke Zero, so we're good. Remember, we've been talking about baggage, okay? A few weeks ago, we talked about this, the first bag. Anybody remember what the first bag was? Unforgiveness. Remember who keeps imprisoned by unforgiveness is not the person we don't forgive, but it's us. Unforgiveness keeps us from being who God called us to be. And then we got to the bag last week. Y'all remember the bag last week? Yesterday. Yesterday. We can't cling to yesterday and walk anew with God today. So we've been talking about these things that hold us back, these, this baggage. And, and today we come to what I call the biggest, biggest baggage. And it, it really, it kind of oversees those two and in, in, in all baggage for that matter. This baggage we have right here is called control. Control. Do you give God control or are you trying to take control of your life? Here's a good measure. Let me ask you this. Are you a good passenger? Are you a good passenger? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, I've shared with this with you before. Emily rides the, the mayonnaise and I ride the mustard. What does that mean? If you don't remember, when we're driving, I ride 
the mustard, the double yellow line. She rides the mayonnaise, the, the, the white line. And every time I'm riding with her, it feels like I'm about to get hit with a mailbox in the face. It really does. And then when she's riding with me, she thinks I'm going to run into every car. In fact, yesterday, just yesterday, she said, you on the yellow line. I said, no, I'm not. This is the yellow line, and this is not. She said, it's the same. <laughs> well, I would like to think I'm a pretty good driver. I think we all think we're pretty good drivers. But let me tell you a story about a time I got some driving tips. See, it wasn't long ago, and I took a group of our children to Century Kid Camp. And we had two vehicles going, and one vehicle was the minibus and had several of our adult chaperones and several of our kids. And then we had what I called the old van, the silver van that, that smells like mold from 1920. It really does. And we're sitting in this van, and it's me and, and another male chaperone in the front seat. And I'll just tell you it was John Kluwer since he's here. It was me and John. And then there were three people, three little boys, young boys, sitting behind us. Now, these three young boys who were sitting behind us were well, being young boys. But all of a sudden, the boy who was sitting in the middle seat started looking at my GPS. Now, the next thing I knew, he gets excited about my GPS. And, and this little boy sitting in the middle starts telling me about my GPS and that he wants to be my GPS. He said, hey, in a mile, you're going to turn right. I know. Hey, up here, you're going to turn left. I know. But that wasn't the worst of it because on my GPS, it had two things. One of it, it had the speed limit sign. And the next to it, it had the speed I was going. Do you know what this little boy did? And like I said, I won't tell you who it is. This little boy starts saying, Stephen, you're going three miles over the speed limit. I know. Stephen, you're still going one mile over the speed limit. I know. Then I got real worried. I thought he, was, he took his phone out. I'm afraid he was going to start texting his mama that Stephen was speeding. Now, I promise you, every time I get behind one of the vehicles here at church, it is with great dedication to be as safe as possible because this is precious cargo. My mama told me that. This is precious cargo, and I see them as my family. But let me ask you a question. How do I, you think you felt if a fourth grader started telling you how to drive? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. How foolish is it for us to tell God how to drive? How foolish is it to tell God his plans and what he should or shouldn't do or to question them. See, when it comes to God, you and I are not even on the kindergarten level of understanding of his plans. And he's already got his bachelor's degree and three master's degree and four or five doctorates. God knows exactly what he's doing. And too often times we try to look at God and tell God what he should or shouldn't do or, or to question. And here's the thing about God. God knows God has a plan and it's a very good plan. So it's time for us to let up of the control so we can follow God's plan. Let's see that in the Word of God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 29. We're going to be looking at verse 11. Once again, that's Jeremiah 29, looking at verse 11. And we're going to be looking at these words from the prophet Jeremiah to see how both they apply to his day, but how they apply to our day as well. I invite all who are able to stand for the reading of God's word. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. I'll be reading from the NIV. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for this opportunity to, to come and read your word, to study your word, to be led by it. God, just pour your spirit on us in such a way it pierces our, our minds and our hearts that, God, you can transform us to be more like you and who you've called us to be. And God, help us to know that starts as we give control over to you. So God, move in us in a mighty way. Draw us close to you through your word. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Like I said, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing most of us have heard that verse or know that verse, might even have that, that verse memorized. So before we get to the verse, let, let's get a little context of what's going on. Now this comes from the prophet of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is an incredible book, and it's made up of many different parts. But the part we're going to here 
is, is Jeremiah talking to some exiles. Now, remember first that, that Jeremiah was known as maybe the weeping prophet, but, but because he was known as the weeping prophet did not make him a weak prophet. In fact, Jeremiah is one of the strongest men in the Bible if you read about him. And he's one of the most persecuted prophets of the Bible as well. There's many times you read in Jeremiah where, where he's been a, a arrested or one he's thrown in a, a cistern that, that, that holds water in this, this rock tunnel. Uh, another time he's put in a stoop where he's to stoop over. And because, all this because he was calling God's people to repentance. In fact, even one time when he calls God's people to repentance, he's taken hostage. See, Jeremiah is one of the most persecuted prophets we have in the Bible. And he was persecuted simply because he spoke God's word. And like I said, who's the audience? Well, look at Jeremiah 29.1, and it tells us about who the audience is. It says, this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders and to the priests. The prophets and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So we have a persecuted prophet, arrested and, and scourged and all these things, writing to people in exile, a people who have been moved from their homelands. A persecuted prophet talking to a persecuted people. And see what he says. Go back to verse 10 and see how he starts talking from persecuted to persecuted person. Hear what he says in verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed from Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Now, that's an incredible verse. You know why that's so incredible? Because look what it says. It says God will fulfill his promise. I have some wonderful, amazing, really good news for you. You ready for it? God fulfills every single promise he makes. Hear me again. God fulfills every single promise he makes. There's not one promise that God doesn't fulfill. There's not one time God says yes and does something different. Or one time God says no and does something different. God does exactly what he says he's going to do. I love how scripture points this out in Joshua 21:45. It says not one of all the Lord's good promises to Israel failed. Every promise was fulfilled. I love what Philippians 1.6 says. Philippians 1.6 says, Be in confidence of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out upon the completion until the day of the Lord. All right, hear me loud again. If God tells you something he's going to do, guess what? He does it. Hear it again. If God says something he's going to do, guess what? He does it. God fulfills every promise. I think we need to say that. God fulfills every promise. That's important. Because would we ever want to relinquish control to somebody over our life who doesn't do what he says? No. I wouldn't, would you? No, the reason we can relinquish control to God is because if God said he's going to do it, he will do it. He fulfills every single promise. And then looks at some of the promise he gives us in that very next verse in verse 11. He says, because I know the plans I have for you. Not only does he say he fulfills every promise, he has a plan for us. That's great news. Well, I kind of skipped over something that's a little hard for us. Look back at verse 10 where it says, in 70 years. Do you know sometimes God fulfills promises in his time and not ours? Anybody enjoy that? Do you know God's timing is a whole lot different than ours? Because we're impatient. Raise your hand. No, no, no. If I said raise your hand, you're impatient. I guess most of our hands, if not all of our hands, would go up. So remember, we can't just look at this as we talk about giving control. We're not talking about in just this moment that this is going to happen exactly once again. We've taken control. God says, hey, guess what? I fulfill every promise. I do it in my time. And guess what? I have plans for you. And look what his plans are. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. I like that verse. Anybody else like that verse? He has a plan for us, for a hope and a future, not to harm us, to prosper us. 
Here what it's saying is, hey, guess what? God does everything he says he's going to do. It's in his time, but he does everything he says he's going to do. And he has an awesome and good plan for us. Everybody say good. I'll draw it out a little longer. Say good. God has a good plan for us. A good plan. In fact, it's a perfect plan, is it not? God has a perfect plan for us. So how do I, how do I give up control then? I'm glad you asked. Number one, we have to understand God knows that good plan and we don't. God knows and we don't. It doesn't say, for you know the plans I have for you. It says, for I know, declares the Lord. God knows the plan. He knows the master plan. He knows exactly what's going on. Sometimes we don't. I experienced this just yesterday. My son Max won a little BB gun at a dinner a long time ago, and we got it out yesterday to shoot it. And we're playing with this BB gun, and this is the most complex gun I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm serious. We put a BB in there, and it just rolls out the end. I put another BB in there, and it rolls out the end. It's not how it's supposed to go. Pew! It didn't do that. So I did what any good dad did. I got the instructions, and I skimmed them. I read like two of them, and it still wouldn't work. So I did the most logical thing I could think of. I gave it to Emily. And so Emily takes it, and she messes with it, and it doesn't really work. And then she, she actually, I think, reads more in the instructions. Still not working exactly right. We do that sometimes with our faith life, don't we? We want to skim the instructions or get somebody else to do it. So she, she, she gets it going after a lot of work, and I think it shot for what, four or five BBs, maybe. Then it stopped working. Damn, the most complex gun I've ever seen. Here's the thing. If I would have had the person who make the gun, the engineer of the gun, show up, you think he could show me how to use it? Absolutely. Here's the thing. The one who made life, the one who originated life, the one who has the blueprints, don't you think he's the one who tells how to live? See, we want to skim the instructions sometimes or ask somebody else to do it for us, but we fail to go to the one who created it all, the one who speaks life the one who gives life, the one who formed you in your mother's room. Do you know? That's a Jeremiah 29, uh, Jeremiah verse 2. Do you know God formed you, formed you in your mother's womb? He created your inmost being. He knows the number of hairs on your head. So don't you think that originator of life, that creator of life, that one who is fully in charge, don't you think he needs to be in control? That's why the Bible says, for he knows the plans. I don't. I have no idea what tomorrow holds. Who had any idea that 2020 would have a pandemic? We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know the one who holds all tomorrows. For I know the plans, declares the Lord. So in order for us to give control, in order for us to take the baggage of control and to drop it so that we can walk freely in abundant life, it starts with understanding we don't know, but he does. And then also knowing not only do we not know, but look at that part, uh, second part of verse again. His plans that he knows are plans to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us a hope and a future. Not only does God know plans for us, he has good plans for us. Say it again. Say good. Good. He has good plans for you. Now you might say, well, there's heartache and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Because of my sin and because of the sin of the world, there will be hardships. There are hardships all the time. We live in a fallen world. But that does not change the goodness of God. That does not change the goodness of his plans. I was thinking about some of the, the goodness of God's plans in my own life and the things that he showed me and thought of several verses that came to mind. And one of my favorites, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that Jesus tells us, trust in the Lord. With all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do you know God has a plan to give you a straight path in life? He doesn't give you 14 different ways and say, choose the right one. We think that sometimes as Christians. We're like, oh, I don't know what to do. God doesn't do that. He doesn't give you 47 options. He gives you his option. And he says, follow me, trust in me, and I'll show you. Oh, that's a good plan. Another good plan of goodness God gives me, Matthew 7, 11 says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Do you know everything good came from God? 
Do you know how many good things you've experienced today already? Do you know you woke up? That's pretty good, isn't it? You got out of bed? That's pretty good. Might have hurt. Might have took you some time. You're sitting right here breathing. That's pretty good, isn't it? Might not be breathing as much as you want, but you're breathing. One day these things will be gone, I promise you. Well, it might be in heaven, but that's all right. That's still one day. Think of all the good things God has given you today. Is he not good? God is good all the time. He is good. That's part of his plan. Oh, there's so much more a part of his plan. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That doesn't see things, all things are good, but God can even use the pain and the hurt and the struggles of life to do good things in your life. God is so good. There's so much more. God's plan includes the gift of his Holy Spirit. Now, that's pretty amazing. Providing for our daily needs, Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Joy, that's a pretty good plan of God. Eternal protection, Hebrews 13, 6. I mean, the word is filled with how God's plans are good for us. Plans to, to help us and to prosper us, to love us. See, here's the thing about control. Not only do I have to trust, I don't know, but I know who does know. But the one who does know who is God has good things in store for me. That's how you begin to give up control and surrender to God is realizing that anything you can do pales in comparison to the goodness God will show you if you follow him. God has good things in store for you. But then there's a third part. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, give you hope and future. But look at verse 12. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. Hey, I have great news from you. God says, if you seek me, you'll find me. If you talk to me, I'll listen to you. If you surrender control over the things you have and instead chase after me, run after me, I will be standing there with arms wide open to accept you. We have a God who speaks things into existence, who is powerful, mighty, and places the stars in heaven. But then he stands and says, guess what? Even though I'm that mighty and great and amazing, I want to have a personal relationship with you. How awesome is that? How awesome is that? That God himself wants to know us personally. God is so good. So, so good. See, how we give control to God is to realize, God, you are good. Man, you're so good. You're so amazing. You're so wonderful. You know what's coming ahead, and you have awesome plans, and you want me to experience that. And if I can't control my life, and I try to do it on my own, I will fail. See, there's a song put out by, by Carrie Underwood called Jesus Take the Wheel. You've ever heard that song? It's a good song. I like this song. It's talking about a young lady who thinks that she hits black ice and starts spinning and says, Jesus, take the wheel. You know, that's what we do a lot of times. Things get tough. We say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, I need you. Well, here's the problem with that. We don't ever not need Jesus. I know that's a double negative English people, but that's okay. We don't ever not need Jesus. We need Jesus every second of every minute of every hour of every day. Do we not? So we should never ever want to have control of the own will of our life we should say god please take the will take the car take the house take the lot take everything you want lord and just show me that straight path to follow let me ask you an honest question do you truly give control of your life to god for i know the plans declare the lord i know the plans plans to prosper you not to harm you to give you a hope and a future. Man, that's so much better than I can do controlling my life. What about you? What about you? So let me ask you again, does God have control of your life? Over your choice of occupation? Over your relationships? Over how you spend your money? Over how you spend your time? Does God have control? Now, I know it's hard. It's, it's that battle we have. In fact, there's a, a quote by Carlton Pearson that says this, Sometimes God doesn't tell us his plan because we wouldn't believe it anyway. There's a lot of things God doesn't tell us. That's where faith comes into place, does it not? Listen, if you can walk with God just by your understanding, you're not walking with God. 
hear that again. If you're walking with God just based on your, your rationale and understanding, you're not walking with God. It takes faith. It is by faith you believe. Faith. We've got to let go. We've got to let Jesus take control. Will you let him? In a moment, we'll have a time of invitation. I invite you to be honest with yourself. Ask God, hey God, have I got control of my own life? Am I falling your way? He says, for I know the plans. I know the plans. Are you following his plans or your plans? Are you being impatient with his plans? I know I'm guilty of that. Remember the Israelites, they walked in the wilderness for how long? 40 years. They said 70 years before they returned from exile. Man, that doesn't always make me feel excited. We're called to be patient, enduring, long-suffering. Maybe you just need to ask God to help you be more patient in his plans. Maybe you just need to say, God, take over my plans. You can come to the altar and pray. You want to come talk to me? I'd love to. Hear that verse again. This is an exciting verse. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a what? Future. future. He holds the future. Will you let him hold you now in the present? Let's pray. God, we just ask you, Lord, to move in us in a mighty way. Help us realize, God, that we don't know. Help us admit we don't know. We can have all the best laid plans, but God, you establish our steps. So help us realize we need you, your knowledge, your understanding. And help us know that, God, not just knowing that you have plans for us, you have good, really good plans for us. In fact, God, like the girl signed today, one day we don't have to worry with all this heartbreak and tears. You have good plans for us in the future and now in the present. So God, instead of seeking after our own will, our own desires, our own way, help us seek after you and we'll find you. Help us turn to you. God, we need you so much. We need to let go of this control and give it to you. Let us leave this baggage behind. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. By say, God has a plan. God has a plan. It's, good. it's good. So I surrender control. So I surrender control. You know, a few weeks ago I walked in with uh, all three of these suitcases. Um, I looked kind of silly. I felt kind of silly. And I about put a hole in the wall, but luckily I didn't. I'll get there. Oh. Anybody want to walk around life like this? Really, does anybody want to walk around life like this? So you know what I need to do? Seriously. God has a plan. God has a good plan for you. So let God have control. Let's pray. 
God, you're truly good. Man, you're good. You're so amazing. You're so powerful. You hold yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You have a plan. God, I love what the song the girls signed, that one day, God, one day when, when, when you call us home, Lord, there will be no tears, no pain, no crying. There's none of that. But, God, until then, you still want us to experience abundant life here. But we experience that abundant life not in what we do, but, God, in what you do through us. So, God, help us surrender into control to you in a mighty, mighty way. Help us seek you. Help us love you. Help us let go of these things that hinder us and follow you. God, we need you, and we thank you that you're a God that fulfills every need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.